Chapter 14 We went to see the Cathedral of Notre Dame. We had heard of it before. It surprises me sometimes to think how much we do know and how intelligent we are. We recognized the brown old Gothic pile in a moment. It was like the pictures. We stood at a little distance and changed from one point of observation to another and gazed long at its lofty square towers and its rich front, clustered thick with stony, mutilated saints who had been looking calmly down from their perches for ages. The Patriarch of Jerusalem stood under them in the old days of chivalry and romance and preached the Third Crusade more than 600 years ago. And since that day, they have stood there and looked quietly down upon the most thrilling scenes, the grandest pageants, the most extraordinary spectacles that have grieved or delighted Paris. These battered and broken-nosed old fellows saw many and many a cavalcade of mail-clad knights come marching home from the Holy Land. They heard the bells above them, told the signal for the St. Bartholomew's Massacre, and they saw the slaughter that followed. Later, they saw the reign of terror, the carnage of the revolution, the overthrow of a king, the coronation of two Napoleons, the christening of the young prince that lords it over a regiment of servants on the Tuileries today, and they may possibly continue to stand there until they see the Napoleon dynasty swept away in the banners of a great republic floating above its ruins. I wish these old parties could speak. They could tell a tale worth the listening to. They say that a pagan temple stood where Notre Dame is now. In the old Roman days, 18 or 20 centuries ago, Remains of it are still preserved in Paris, and that a Christian church took its place about A.D. 300. Another took the place of that in A.D. 500. And that the foundations of the present cathedral were laid about A.D. 1100. The ground ought to be measurably sacred by this time, one would think. One portion of this noble old edifice is suggestive of the quaint fashions of ancient times. It was built by Jean sans Pur, Duke of Burgundy, to set his conscience at rest. He had assassinated the Duke of Orleans. Alas, those good old times are gone when a murderer could wipe the stain from his name and soothe his troubles to sleep simply by getting out his bricks and mortar and building an additional church. The portals of the Great Western Front are bisected by square pillars. They took the central one away in 1852 on the occasion of thanksgivings for the reinstitution of the presidential power. But precious soon they had occasion to reconsider that motion and put it back again. And they did. We loitered through the Grand Isles for an hour or two, staring up at the rich stained glass windows embellished with blue and yellow and crimson saints and martyrs, and trying to admire the numberless great pictures in the chapels. And then we were admitted to the sacristy and shown the magnificent robes which the Pope wore when he crowned Napoleon I. A wagon load of solid gold and silver utensils used in the great public processions and ceremonies of the church, some nails of the true cross, a fragment of the cross itself, a part of the crown of thorns. We had already seen a large piece of the true cross in a church in the Azores, but no nails. They showed us likewise the bloody robe which that Archbishop of Paris wore, who exposed his sacred person and braved the wrath of the insurgents of 1848. 
to mount the barricades and hold aloft the olive branch of peace in the hope of stopping the slaughter. His noble effort cost him his life. He was shot dead. They showed us a cast of his face taken after death, the bullet that killed him, and the two vertebrae in which it lodged. These people have a somewhat singular taste in the matter of relics. Ferguson told us that the silver cross, which the good archbishop Bishop wore at his girdle, was seized and thrown into the Seine, where it lay embedded in the mud for fifteen years, and then an angel appeared to a priest and told him where to die for it. He did die for it, and got it, and now it is there on exhibition at Notre Dame, to be inspected by anybody who feels an interest in inanimate objects of miraculous intervention. Next, we went to visit the morgue, that horrible receptacle for the dead who die mysteriously and leave the manner of their taken off, taken off a dismal secret. We stood before a grating and looked through into a room which was hung all about with the clothing of dead men coarse blouses, water-soaked, the delicate garments of women and children, patrician vestments, hacked and stabbed and stained with red, a hat that was crushed and bloody. On a slanting stone lay a drowned man, naked, swollen, purple, clasping, clasping the fragment of a broken bush with a grip which death had so petrified that human strength could not unloose it. Mute witness of the last despairing effort to save the life that was doomed beyond all help. A stream of water trickled ceaselessly over the hideous face. We knew that the body and the clothing were there for identification by friends, but still we wondered if anybody could love that repulsive object or grieve for its loss. We grew meditative and wondered if, some forty years ago, when the mother of that ghastly thing was dandling it upon her knee and kissing it and petting it and displaying it with satisfied pride to the passers-by, a prophetic vision of this dread ending ever flitted through her brain. I half feared that the mother or the wife or a brother of the dead man might come while we stood there. But nothing of the kind occurred. Men and women came, and some looked eagerly in and pressed their faces against the bars. Others glanced carelessly at the body and turned away with a disappointed look. People, I thought, who live upon strong excitements and who attend the exhibitions of the morgue regularly, just as other people go to see theatrical spectacles every night. When one of these looked in and passed on, I could not help thinking, now this don't afford you any satisfaction, a party with his head shot off is what you need. One night, we went to the celebrated Jardin Mobile, but only stayed a little while. We wanted to see some kind of, some of this kind of Paris life, however, and therefore the next night we went to a similar place of entertainment in a great garden in the suburb of Asniers. We went to the railroad depot toward evening, and Ferguson got tickets for a second-class carriage. Such a perfect jam of people I have not often seen, but there was no noise, no disorder, no rowdyism. Some of the women and young girls that entertained the train we knew to be of the demi-monde, but others we were not at all sure about. The girls and women in our carriage behaved themselves modestly and becomingly all the way out, except that they smoked. When we arrived at the garden in Asniers, we paid a franc or two admission and entered a place which had flower beds in it and grass plots and long, curving rows of ornamental shrubbery, with here and there a secluded bower convenient for eating ice cream in. 
We moved along the sinuous gravel rocks with a great concourse of girls and young men, and suddenly a domed and filigreed white temple starred over and over and over again with brilliant gas jets burst upon us like a fallen sun. Nearby was a large, ha handsome house with its ample front illuminated in the same way, and above its roof floated the star-spangled banner of America. Well, I said, how is this? It nearly took my breath away. Ferguson said an American, a New Yorker, kept the place and was carrying on quite a stirring opposition to the Jardine Mobile. Crowds composed of both sexes and nearly all ages were frisking about the garden or sitting in the open air in front of the flagstaff and the temple, drinking wine and coffee or smoking. The dancing had not begun yet. Ferguson said there was to be an exhibition. The famous Blondin was going to perform on a tightrope in another part of the garden. We went thither. Here the light was dim and the masses of people were pretty closely packed together. And now I made a mistake, which any donkey might make, but a sensible man never. I committed an error which I find myself repeating every day of my life. Standing right before a young lady, I said, Dan, just look at this girl, how beautiful she is. I thank you more for the evident sincerity of the compliment, sir, than for the extraordinary publicity you have given to it, this in good, pure English. We took a walk, but my spirits were very, very sadly dampened. I did not feel right comfortable for some time afterward. Why will people be so stupid as to suppose themselves the only foreigners among a crowd of ten thousand persons? But Blondin came out shortly. He appeared on a stretched cable far away above the sea of tossing hats and handkerchiefs, and in the glare of hundreds of rockets that whizzed heavenward by him, he looked like a wee insect. He balanced his pole and walked the length of his rope, two or three hundred feet. He came back and got a man and carried him across. He returned to the center and danced a jig. Next, he performed some gymnastic and balancing feats, too perilous to afford a pleasant spectacle, and he finished by fastening to his person a thousand Roman candles, Catherine wheels, serpents, and rockets, of all manner of brilliant colors, setting them on fire all at once and walking and waltzing across his rope again in a blinded blaze of glory that lit up the garden and the people's faces like a great conflagration at midnight. The dance had begun and we adjourned to the temple. Within it was a drinking saloon and all around it was a broad, circular platform for the dancers. I backed up against the wall of the temple and waited. Twenty sets formed, the music struck up, and then I placed my hands before my face for very shame. But I looked through my fingers. They were dancing the renowned Can-Can. A handsome girl in the set before me tripped forward slightly to meet the opposite gentleman, tripped back again, grasped her dresses vigorously on both sides with her hands, raised them pretty high, danced an extraordinary jig that had more activity and exposure about it than any jig I ever saw before, and then, drawing her clothes still higher, she advanced gaily to the center and launched a vicious kick full at her vis-a-vis -vis that must infallibly have removed his nose if he had been seven feet high. It was a mercy he was only six. That is the can-can. The idea of it is to dance as wildly, as noisily, as furiously as you can. Expose yourself as much as possible if you are a woman, and kick as high as you can, no matter which sex you belong to. There is no word of exaggeration in this. Any of the staid, respectable aged people who were there that night can testify to the truth of that statement. There were a good many such people present, 
I suppose French morality is not of that straight-laced description which is shocked at trifles. I moved aside and took a general view of the can-can. Shouts, laughter, furious music, a bewildering chaos of darden and intermingling forms, stormy jerkin and snatching of gay dresses, bobbing beads, flying arms, lightning flashes of white stockinged calves and dainty slippers in the air, and then a grand final rush, riot, a terrific hubbub, and a wild stampede. Heavens, nothing like it has been seen on earth since Trembling Sham O'Shanter saw the devil and the witches at their orgies that stormy night in Alloway's Auld Haunted Kirk. We visited the Louvre at a time when we had no silk purchases in view and looked at its miles of paintings by the old masters. Some of them were beautiful, but at the same time they carried such evidences about them of the cringing spirit of those great men that we found small pleasure in examining them. Their nauseous adulation of princely patrons was more prominent to me and chained my attention more surely than the charms of color and expression which are claimed to be in the pictures. Gratitude for kindnesses as well, but it seems to me that some of those artists carried it so far that it ceased to be gratitude and became worship. If there is a plausible excuse for the worship of men, then by all means let us forgive Rubens and his brethren. But I will drop the subject, lest I say something about the old masters that might as well be left unsaid. Of course, we drove in the Bois de Boulogne, that limitless park with its forests, its lakes, its cascades, and its broad avenues. There were thousands upon thousands of vehicles abroad, and the scene was full of life and gaiety. There were very common hacks with father and mother and all the children in them, conspicuous little open carriages with celebrated ladies of questionable reputation in them. There were dukes and duchesses abroad, with gorgeous footmen perched behind, and equally gorgeous out outriders perched on each of the six horses. There were blue and silver and green and gold and pink and black and all sorts and descriptions of stunning and startling liveries out. And I almost yearned to be a flunky myself for the sake of the fine clothes. But presently the emperor came along and he outshone them all. He was preceded by a bodyguard of gentlemen on horseback in showy uniforms. His carriage horses, horses, there appeared to be somewhere in the remote neighborhood of a thousand of them, were bestridden by gallant-looking fellows, also in stylish uniforms. And after the carriage followed another detachment of bodyguards. Everybody got out of the way. Everybody bowed to the emperor and his friend, the sultan, and they went by on a swinging trot and disappeared. I will not describe the boys de Boulogne. I cannot do it. It is simply a beautiful, cultivated, endless, wonderful wilderness. It is an enchanting place. It is in Paris now, one may say, but a crumbling old cross in one portion of it reminds one that it was not always so. The cross marks the spot where a celebrated, celebrated troubadour was waylaid and murdered in the 14th century. It was in this park that that fellow with an unpronounceable name made the attempt upon the Russian Tsar's life in the last spring with a pencil, pistol. The bullet struck a tree. Ferguson showed us the place. Now in America, that interest in tree will be chopped down or forgotten within the next five years, but it will be treasured here. The guides will point it out to visitors for the next 800 years, and when it decays and falls down, they will put up another there and go on with the same old story, just the same. Chapter 15
One of our pleasantest visits was to the Père de la Chaise, the national burying ground of France. The honor, honored resting place of some of her greatest and best children, the last home of scores of illustrious men and women who were born to no titles, but achieved fame by their own energy and their own genius. It is a solemn city of winding streets and of miniature marble temples and mansions of the dead, gleaming white from out of a wilderness of foliage and fresh flowers. Not every city is so well peopled as this, or has so ample an area within its walls. Few palaces exist in any city that are so exquisite in design, so rich in art, so costly in material, so graceful, so beautiful. We had stood in the ancient church of St. Denis, where the marble effigies of thirty generations of kings and queens lay stretched at length upon the tombs, and the sensations invoked were startling and novel. The curious armor, the obsolete costumes, the placid faces, the hands placed palm to palm in eloquent supplication, it was a vision of gray antiquity. It seemed curious enough to be standing face to face, as it were, with old Dagobert I and Clovis and Charlemagne, those vague, colossal heroes, those shadows, those myths of a thousand years ago. I touched their dust-covered faces with my finger, but Dagobert was deader than the sixteen centuries that have passed over him. Clovis slept well after his labor for Christ, and old Charlemagne went on dreaming of his paladins, of bloody Ronskin vows, and gave no heed to me. The great names of Père Lachaise impress one, too, but differently. There, the suggestion brought constantly to mind is that this place is sacred to a nobler royalty, the royalty of heart and brain. Every faculty of mind, every noble trait of human nature, every high occupation which men engage, engage in seems represented by a famous name. The effect is a curi curious medley. Devoust and Messina, who wrought in many a battle tragedy, are here, and also is Rachel, of equal renown in mimic tragedy on the stage. The Abbey Sicard sleeps here, the first great teacher of the deaf and dumb, a man whose heart went out to every unfortunate, and whose life was given to kindly offices in their service, and not far off in repose and peace at last lies Marshal Ney, whose stormy spirit knew no music like the bugle called the arms. The man who originally originated public gas lighting, and that other benefactor who introduced the cultivation of the potato and thus blessed millions of his starving countrymen, lie with the Prince of Maserano and with exiled queens and princes of further India. Gay Lussac, the chemist, Laplace, the astronomer, Larry, the surgeon, de Souza, the advocate, are here. And with them are Talma, Bellini, Rubini, de Balzac, Beaumarchais, Beranger, Moliere, and La Fontaine, and scores of other men whose names and whose worthy labors are as familiar in the remote by places of the civilization as are the historic deeds of the kings and princes that sleep in the marble vaults of St. Denis. But among the thousands and thousands of tombs in Père Lachaise, there is one there is one that no man, no woman, no youth of either sex ever passes by without stopping to examine. Every visitor has a sort of indistinct idea of the history of its dead, and comprehends that homage is due there, but not one in twenty thousand clearly remembers the story of that tomb and its romantic occupants. This is the grave of Abelard and Heloise, a grave which has been more revered, more widely known, more written and sung about and wept over for seven hundred years 
than any other in Christendom, save only that of the Savior. All visitors linger pensively about it. All young people capture and carry away keepsakes and mementos of it. All Parisian youths and maidens who are disappointed in love come there to bail out when they are full of tears. Yea, many stricken lovers make pilgrimages to this shrine from distant provinces to weep and wail and grit their teeth over their heavy sorrows and to purchase the sympathies of the chastened spirits of that tomb with offerings of immortelles and budding flowers. Go when you will, you will find somebody snuffling over that tomb. Go when you will, you find it furnished with those bouquets and immortelles. Go when you will, you find a gravel train from Marseille or arriving to supply the deficiencies caused by memento cabbaging vandals whose affections have miscarried. Yet who really knows the story of Abelard and Heloise? Precious few people. The names are perfectly familiar to everybody, and that is about all. With infinite pains I have acquired a knowledge of that history, and I propose to narrate it here partly for the honest information of the public, and partly to show that public that they have been wasting a good deal of marketable sentiment very unnecessarily. The Story of Abelard and Heloise Heloise was born 766 years ago. She may have had parents. There is no telling. She lived with her uncle Fulbert, a canon of the Cathedral of Paris. I do not know what a canon of a cathedral is, but it is, that is what he was. He was nothing more than a sort of a mountain howitzer, likely, because they had no heavy artillery in those days. Suffice it, then, that Heloise lived with her uncle, uncle the howitzer, and was happy. She spent most of her childhood in the convent of Argentuil. Never heard of Argentuil before, but suppose there really was such a place. She then returned to her uncle, the old gun, or son of a gun, as the case may be, and he taught her to write and speak Latin, which was the language of literature and polite society at that period. Just at this time, Pierre Abelard, who had already made himself widely famous as a rhetorician, came to found a school of rhetoric in Paris. The originality of his principles, his eloquence, and his great physical strength and beauty created a profound sensation. He saw Heloise and was captivated by her blooming youth, her beauty, and her charming disposition. He wrote to her. She answered. He wrote again. She answered again. He was now in love. He longed to know her, to speak to her face to face. His school was near Fulbert's house. He asked Fulbert to allow him to call. The good old swivel saw here a rare opportunity. His niece, whom he loved so much, would absorb knowledge from this man, and it would not cost him a cent. Such was Fulbert, penurious. Fulbert's first name is not mentioned by any author, which is unfortunate. However, George W. Fulbert will answer for him as well as any. We will let him go at that. He asked Abelard to teach her. Abelard was glad enough of the opportunity. He came often and stayed long. A letter of his shows in its very first sentence that he came under that friendly roof like a cold-hearted villain as he was, with the deliberate intention of debauching a confiding, innocent girl. This is the letter. I cannot cease to be astonished at the simplicity of Fulbert. I was as much surprised as if he had placed a lamb in the power of a hungry wolf. Heloise and I, under pretext of study, gave ourselves up wholly to love, and the solitude that love seeks our studies procured for us. Books were open before us, but we spoke oftener of love than philosophy, and kisses came more readily from our lips than words. And so, exulting over an honorable confidence, which to his deranged instinct was a ludicrous simplicity, this unmanly Abelard seduced the niece of the man whose guest he was. Paris found it out. 
Fulbert was told of it, told often, but refused to believe it. He could not comprehend how a man could be so depraved as to use the sacred protection and security of hospitality as a means for the commission of such a crime as that. But when he heard the rowdies in the street singing the love songs of Abelard to Heloise, the case was too plain. Love songs come, come not properly within the teachings of rhetoric and philosophy. He drove Abelard from his house. Abelard returned secretly and carried Heloise away to Palais in Brittany, his native country. Here, shortly afterward, she bore a son who from his rare beauty was surnamed Astrolabe, William G. The girl's flight enraged at Fulbert, and he longed for vengeance, but feared to strike lest retaliation visit Heloise, for he still loved her tenderly. At length Abelard offered to marry Heloise, but on a shameful condition, that the marriage should be kept secret from the world, to the end that, while her good name remained a wreck as before, his priestly reputation might be kept untarnished. It was that it was like that miscreant. Fulbert saw his opportunity and consented. He would see the parties married and then violate the confidence of the man who had taught him that trick. He would divulge the secret and so remove somewhat of the obloquy that attached to his niece's name. But his but the but the niece suspected his scheme. She refused the marriage at first. She said Fulbert would betray the secret to save her, and besides, she did not wish to drag down a lover who was so gifted, so honored by the world, and who had such a splendid career before him. It was noble, self-sacrifice and love, and characteristic of the pure-souled Heloise, but it was not good sense. But she was over overruled, and the private marriage took place now for, for Fulbert. The heart so wounded should be healed at last. The proud spirit so tortured should find rest again. The humbled head should be lifted up once more. He proclaimed the marriage in the high place of the city and rejoiced that dishonor had departed from his house. But lo, Abelard denied the marriage. Heloise denied it. The people, knowing the former circumstances, might have believed Fulbert had only Abelard denied it, but when the person chiefly interested, the girl herself, denied it, they laughed, despairing Fulbert to scorn. The poor canon of the Cathedral of Paris was spiked again. The last hope of repairing the wrong that had been done his house was gone. What next? Human nature suggested revenge. He compassed it, the historian says, Ruffians, hired by Fulbert, fell upon Abelard by night and inflicted upon him a terrible and nameless mutil mutilation. I am seeking the last resting place of those ruffians. When I find it, I shall shed some tears on it and stack up some bouquets and immortelles and cart away from it some gravel whereby to remember that howsoever blotted by crime their lives may have been, those ruffians did one just deed, at any rate, albeit it was not warranted by the strict letter of the law. Heloise entered a convent and gave goodbye to the world and its pleasures for all time. For twelve years she never heard of Abelard, never even heard his name mentioned. She had become prioress of Argentuil and led a life of complete seclusion. She happened one day to see a letter written by him in which he narrated his own story. She cried over it and wrote him. He answered, addressing her as his sister in Christ. They continued to correspond, she in the unweighed language of unwavering affection, he in the chilly phraseology of the polished rhetorician. She poured out her heart in passionate, disjointed sentences, he replied with finished essays, divided deliberately into heads and subheads, premises and argument. She showered upon him the tenderest epithets that love could devise. He addressed her from the north pole of his frozen heart as the spouse of Christ, the abandoned villain. 
on account of her too easy government of her nuns, some disreputable irregularities were discovered among them, and the abbot of St. Denise broke up her establishment. Abelard was the official head of the monastery of St. Gildas de Ries at that time, and when he heard of her homeless condition, a sentiment of pity was aroused in his breast. It is a wonder the unfamiliar emotion did not blow his head off and he placed her and her troop in the little oratory of the Paraclay, a religious establishment which he had founded. She had many privations and sufferings to undergo at first, but her worth and her gentle disposition won influential friends for her, and she built up a wealthy and flourishing nunnery. She became a great favorite with the heads of the church and also the people, though she seldom appeared in public. She rapidly advanced in esteem, in good report, and in usefulness, and Abelard as rapidly lost ground. The Pope so honored her that he made her the head of her order. Abelard, a man of splendid talents, and ranking as the first debater of his time, became timid, irresolute, and distrustful of his powers. He only needed a great misfortune to topple him from the high position he held in the world of intellectual excellence. And it came, urged by kings and princes to meet the subtle St. Bernard and debate and crush him, he stood up in the presence of a royal and illustrious assemblage, and when his antagonist had finished, he looked about him, looked about him and stammered a commencement. But his courage failed him. The cunning of his tongue was gone. With his speech unspoken, he trembled and sat down, a disgraced and vanquished champion. He died in nobody, and was buried at Cluny in 1144. They removed his body to the Paraclay afterwards, and when Heloise died, twenty years later, they buried her with him, in accordance with her last wish. He died at the ripe age of sixty-four, and she at sixty-three. After the bodies had remained entombed three hundred years, they were removed once more. They were removed again in 1800, and finally, 17 years afterwards. They were taken up and transferred to the Père Lachaise, where they will remain in place and quiet until it comes time for them to get up and move again. History is silent concerning the last acts of the mountain howitzer. Let the world say what it will about him. I, at least, shall always respect the memory and sorrow for the abused trust and the broken heart and the troubled spirit of the old smooth bore. Rest and repose be his. Such is the story of Abelard and Heloise. Such is the history that Lamartine has shed upon character, cataracts of tears, that Lamartine has shed cataracts of tears over. But that man never could come within the influence of a subject in the least pathetic without overflowing his banks. He ought to be damned, or levied, I should more properly say. Such is the history, not as it, as it is usually told, but as it is when stripped of the nauseous sentimentality that would enshrine our loving worship. Uh, for our loving worship, a dastardly seducer like Pierre Abelard. I have not a word to say against the misused, faithful girl, and would not withhold from her grave a single one of those simple tributes which blighted youths and maidens offer to her memory, but I am sorry enough that I have not had time and opportunity to write four or five volumes of my opinion of her friend, the founder of the Parachute, or the Paraclete, or whatever it was. The tons of sentiment I have wasted on that unprincipled humbug in my in ignorance, I shall throttle down my emotions hereafter about this sort of people until I have read them up and know whether they are, are entitled to any tearful attentions or not. I wish I had my immortelles back now and that bunch of radishes. In Paris, we often saw in shop windows the sign English spoken here just as one sees in the windows at home the sign, is he on par, par le Francais? We always invaded these places at once, and invari invariably received the information, framed in faultless French, 
that the clerk who did the English for the establishment had just gone to dinner and would be back in an hour. Would Miss Yu buy something? We wondered why those parties happened to take their dinners at such erratic and extraordinary hours, for we never called in a time when an exemplary Christian would be in the least likely to be abroad on such an errand. The truth was, it was a base fraud, a snare to trap the, trap the unwary, chaff to catch fledglings with. They had no English murdering, murdering clerk. They trusted to the sign to inveigle foreigners into their lairs, and trusted to their own blandishments to keep them there until they bought something. We ferreted out another French imposition, a frequent sign to this effect. All manner of American drinks artistically prepared here. We, pro we procured the service of a gentleman experienced in the nomenclature of the American bar, and moved upon the works of one of these impostors. A bowing, aproned Frenchman skipped forward and said, Que vous les monsieurs? I do not know what que vous les, les monsieurs means, but such was his remark. Our general said, We will take a whiskey, straight. A stare from the Frenchman. Well, if you don't know what that is, give us a champagne cocktail. A stare and a shrug. Well, then give us a sherry cobbler. The Frenchman was checkmated. This was all Greek to him. Give us a brandy smash. The Frenchman began to back away, suspicious of the ominous vigor of the last order. He began to back away, shrugging his shoulders and spreading his hands apologetically. The general followed him up and gained a complete victory. The uneducated foreigner could not even furnish a Santa Cruz punch, an eye-opener, an eye a stone fence, or an earthquake. It was plain that he was a wicked impostor. An acquaintance of mine said the other day that he was doubtless the only American visitor to the exposition who had had the high honor of being escorted by the emperor's bodyguard. I said with unobtrusive frankness that I was astonished that such a long-legged, long lantern-jawed, unprepossessing-looking specter as he should be singled out for a distinction like that and asked how it came about. He said he had attended a great military review in the Champ de Mars some time ago, and while the multitude about him was growing thicker and thicker every moment, he observed an open space inside the railing. He left his carriage and went into it. He was the only person there, and so he had plenty of room, and the situation being central, he could see all the preparations going on about the field. By and by there was a sound of music, and soon the Emperor of the French and the Emperor of Austria, escorted by the famous Saint Guards, entered the enclosure. They seemed not to observe him, but directly, in response to a sign from the commander of the guard, a young lieutenant came toward him with a file of his men following, halted, raised his hand, and gave the military salute and then said in a low voice that he was sorry to have to disturb a stranger and a gentleman, but the place was sacred to royalty. Then, with the officer beside him, the file of men marching behind him, and with every mark of respect, he was escorted to his carriage by the imperial Saint Guards. The officer saluted again and fell back. The New Jersey Sprite bowed in return and had presence of mind enough to pretend that he had simply called on a matter of private business with those emperors, and so waved them an adieu and drove from the field. Imagine a poor Frenchman ignorantly intruding upon a public rostrum sacred to some sixpenny dignitary in America. The police would scare him to death first with a storm of their elegant blasphemy, and then pull him to pieces getting him away from there. We are measurably superior to the French in some things, but they are immeasurably, immeasurably are better in others. Enough of Paris for the present. We have done our whole duty by it. We have seen the Tuileries, the Napoleon Column, the Madeleine, that wonder, that wonder of wonders, the tomb of Napoleon, all the great churches and museums, libraries, imperial palaces, 
and sculpture and picture galleries, the Pantheon, Jardin de Plans, the Opera, the Circus, the Legislative Body, the Billiard Rooms, the Barbers, the Grisettes. Ah, the Grisettes, I had almost forgotten. They are another romantic fraud. They were, if you let the books of travel tell it, always so beautiful, so neat and trim, so graceful, so naive and trusting, so gentle, so winning, so faithful to their shop duties, so irresistible to buyers in their prattling imp importunity, so devoted to their poverty-stricken students of the Latin Quarter, so light-hearted and happy on their Sunday picnics in the suburbs, and oh, so charmingly, so delightfully immoral. Stuff. For three or four days, I was constantly saying, Quick, Ferguson, is that a grisette? He always said, No. He comprehended at last that I wanted to see a grisette. Then he showed me a dozen of them. They were like nearly all the French women I ever saw. Homely. They had large hands, large feet, large mouths. They had pug noses as a general thing, and mustaches that not even good breeding could overlook. They combed their hair straight back without pardon. They were ill-shaped. They were not winning. They were not graceful. I knew by their looks that they ate garlic and onions. And lastly, and finally, to my thinking, it would be bla base flattery to call them immoral. Aroint thee, wench. I sorrow for the vagabond student of the Latin Quarter now, even more than formerly I envied him. Thus topples to earth another idol of my infancy. We have seen... <clears throat> we have seen everything, and tomorrow we go to Versailles. We shall see Paris only for a little while as we come back to take up our line of march for the ship, and so I may as well bid the beautiful city a regretful farewell. We shall travel many thousands of miles after we leave here and visit many great cities, but we shall find none so enchanting as this. Some of our party have gone to England, intending to take a roundabout course and rejoin the vessel at Leghorn or Naples several weeks hence. We came near going to Geneva, but have concluded to return to Marseille and go up through Italy from, up through Italy from Genoa. I will conclude this chapter with a remark that I am sincerely proud to be able to make, and glad as well that my comrades cordially endorse it, to quit, by far the handsomest women we have seen in France were born and reared in America. I feel now like a man who has redeemed a failing reputation and shed luster upon a dimmed escutcheon by a single just deed done at the eleventh hour. Let the curtain fall to slow music. Chapter 16 Versailles. It is wonderfully beautiful. You gaze and stare and try to understand that it is real, that it is on the earth, that it is not the Garden of Eden. But your brain grows giddy, stupefied by the world of beauty around you, and you half believe you are the dupe of an exquisite dream. The scene thrills one like military music. A noble palace stretching its ornamented front, block upon block away, till it seemed that it would never end, a grand promenade before it, whereon the armies of an empire might parade, all about its rainbows of flowers and colossal statues that were almost numberless, and yet seemed only scattered over the ample space. Broad flights of stone steps leading down from the promenade to lower grounds of the park. Stairways that whole regiments might stand arms, stand to arms upon and have room to spare. Vast fountains whose great bronze effigies discharged rivers of sprinkling water into the air and mingled a hundred curving jets together in forms of matchless beauty. Wide grass-carpeted avenues that branched hither and thither in every direction, 
and wandered to seemingly interminable distances, walled all the way on either side with compact ranks of leafy trees, whose branches met above and formed arches as faultless and as symmetrical as ever were carved in stone. And here and there were glimpses of sylvan lakes with miniature ships glassed in their surfaces, and everywhere, on the palace steps and the great promenade, around the fountains, among the trees, and far under the arches of the endless avenues, hundreds and hundreds of people in gay costumes walked or ran or danced, and gave to the fairy picture the life and animation which was all of perfection it could have lacked. It was worth a pilgrimage to see. Everything is on so gigantic a scale. Nothing is small. Nothing is cheap. The statues are all large. The palace is grand. The park covers a fair-sized county. The avenues are interminable. All the distances and all the dimensions about Versailles are vast. I used to think the pictures exaggerated these distances and these dimensions beyond all reason, and that they made Versailles look more beautiful than it was possible for any place in the world to be. I know now that the pictures never came up to the subject in any respect, and that no painter could represent Versailles on canvas as beautiful as it is in reality. I used to abuse Louis the Fourteenth for spending two hundred millions of dollars in creating this marvelous park when bread was so scarce with some of his subjects. But I have forgiven him now. He took a tract of land sixty miles in circumference and set to work to make the park and build this, his, build this palace and a road to it from Paris. He kept 36,000 men employed daily on it, and the labor was so unhealthy that they used to die and be hauled off by cartloads every night. The wife of a nobleman of the, of the time speaks of this as an inconvenience, but naively remarks that it does not seem worthy of attention in the happy state of tranquility we now enjoy. I always thought ill of people at home who trimmed their shrubbery into pyramids and squares and spires and all manner of unnatural shapes. And when I saw the same thing being practiced in this great park, I began to feel dissatisfied. But I soon saw the idea of the thing and the wisdom of it. They seek the general effect. We distort a dozen secret sickly trees into unaccustomed shapes in a little yard no bigger than a dining room, and then surely they look absurd enough. But here they take 200,000 tall forest trees and set them in a double row, allow no sign of leaf or branch to grow on the trunk lower down than six feet above the ground. From that point the boughs begin to project and very gradually they extend outward further and further till they meet overhead, and a faultless tunnel of foliage is formed. The arch is mathematically precise. The effect is then very fine. They make trees that take fifty different shapes, and so these quaint effects are infinitely varied and picturesque. The trees in no two avenues are shaped alike, and consequently the eye is not fatigued with anything in the nature of monotonous uniformity. I will drop this subject now, leaving it to others to determine how these people manage to make endless ranks of lofty forest trees grow to just a certain thickness of trunk, say a foot and two-thirds, how they make them spring to surprise precisely the same height for miles, how they make them grow so close together, how they compel one huge limb to spring from the same identical spot on each tree and form the main sweep of the arch, and how all these things are kept exactly in the same condition and in the same exquisite shapeliness and symmetry month after month and year after year. For I have tried to reason out the problem and have failed. We walked through the great hall of sculpture and the 150 galleries of paintings in the palace of Versailles, and felt that to be in such a place was useless unless one had a whole year at his disposal. 
These pictures are all battle scenes, and only one solitary little canvas among them, all treats of anything but great French victories. We wandered also through the Grand Trianon and the Petit Trianon, these monuments of royal prodigality, and with histories so mournful, filled as it is with souvenirs of Napoleon I and three dead kings and as many queens. In one sumptuous bed they had all slept in succession, but no one occupies it now. In a large dining room stood the table at which Louis the Fourteenth and his mistress, Madame Maintenon, and after them Louis the Louis the Fifteenth and Pompadour had sat at their meals, naked and unattended, for the table stood upon a trapdoor, which descended with it to regions below when it was necessary to replenish its dishes. In a room of the Petit Trianon stood the furniture, just as poor Marie Antoinette left it when the mob came and dragged her and the king to Paris, never to return. Near at hand, in the stables, were prodigious carriages that showed no color but gold, carriages used by former kings of France on state occasions, and never used now save when a kingly head is to be crowned or an imperial infant Christian christened. And with them were some curious sleighs, whose bodies were shaped like lions, swans, tigers, and so on. Vehicles that had at once been handsome with picture designs and fine workmanship, but were dusty and decaying now. They had their history. When Louis the Fourteenth had finished the Grand Trianon, he told Maintenon that he had created a paradise for her and asked if she could think of anything now to wish for. He said he wished for the Trianon to be perfection, nothing less. She said she can think of but one thing. It was summer, and it was balmy France, yet she would like well to sleigh ride in the leafy avenues of Versailles. The next morning found miles and miles of graffy, grassy avenues, spread thick with snowy salt and sugar, and a procession of those quaint slaves. Slaves waiting to receive the chief concubine of the gayest and most unprincipled court that France has ever seen. From sumptuous Versailles, with its palaces, its statues, its gardens, and its fountains, we journeyed back to Paris and sought its antipodes, the Farberg St. Antoine. Little, narrow streets, dirty children blockading them, greasy, slovenly women capturing and spanking them, filthy dens on first floors with rag stores in them, the heaviest business in the Faubourg is the chiffonniers, other filthy dens where whole suits of second and third hand clothing are sold at prices that would ruin any proprietor who did not steal his stock, still other filthy dens where they sold groceries, sold them by the half penny worth, five dollars would buy the man out, goodwill and all, up these little crooked streets they will murder a man for seven dollars and dump the body in the Seine. And up some other of these streets, most of them, I should say, live Lorettes. Although this Faubourg St. Antoine, misery and poverty, vice and crime go hand in hand, and the evidence of it stare one in the face from every side. Here the people live who begin the revolutions. Whenever there is anything of that kind to be done, they are always ready. They take as much genuine pleasure in building a barricade as they do in cutting a throat or shoving a friend into the Seine. It is these savage-looking ruffians who storm the splendid halls of the Tuileries occasionally and swarm into Versailles when a king is to be called to account. But they will build no more barricades. They will break no more soldiers' heads with paving stones. Louis Napoleon has taken care of that. He is annihilating the crooked streets and building in their stead noble boulevards as straight as an arrow, avenues which a cannonball could traverse from end to end without meeting an, obstruct an obstruction more irresistible than the flesh and bones of men. 
boulevards whose stately edifices will never afford refugees and plotting places for starving, discontented revolution breeders. Five of these great thoroughfares radiate from one ample center, a center which is exceedingly well adapted to the accommodation of heavy artillery. The mobs used to riot there, but they must seek another rallying place in future, and this ingenious Napoleon paves the streets of his great cities with a smooth, compact composition of asphaltum and sand. No more barricades of flagstones, no more assaulting his majesty's troops with cobbles. I cannot feel friendly towards my quondam fellow American, Napoleon III, especially at this time, July 1867 when in fancy I see his credulous victim, Maximilian, lying stark and stiff in Mexico, and his maniac widow watching eagerly from her French asylum for the form that will never come. But I do admire his nerve, his calm self-reliance, his shrewd good sense. Chapter 17 We had a pleasant journey of it seaward again. We found that for the three past nights our ship had been in a state of war. The first night the sailors of a British ship, being happy with grog, came down on the pier and challenged our sailors to a free fight. They accepted with alacrity, repaired to the pier, and gained their share of a drawn battle. Several bruised and bloodied members of both parties were carried off by the police and imprisoned until the following morning. The next night, the British boys came again to renew the fight, but our men had had strict orders to remain on board and out of sight. They did so, and the besieging party grew noisy and more and more abusive as the fact became apparent to them that our men were afraid to come out. They went away, finally, with a closing burst of ridicule and offensive epithets. The third night they came again and were more obstreperous than ever. They swaggered up and down the almost deserted pier and hurled curses, obscenity, and stinging sarcasms at our crew. It was more than human nature could bear. The executive officer ordered our men ashore with instructions not to fight. They charged the British and gained a brilliant victory. I probably would not have mentioned this war had it ended differently, but I traveled to learn, and I still remember that they picture no French defeats in the battle galleries of Versailles. It was like home to us to step on board the comfortable ship again and smoke and lounge about her breezy decks. Yet it was not altogether like home, either, because so many members of the family were away. We missed some pleasant faces which we would rather have found at dinner, and at night there were gaps in the euchre parties which could not be satisfactorily filled. Molt was in England, Jack in Switzerland, Charlie in Spain. Blucher was gone, none could tell where, but we were at sea again and we had the stars and the ocean to look at, and plenty of room to meditate in. In due time, the shores of Italy were sighted, and as we stood gazing from the decks, early in the bright summer morning, the stately city of Genoa rose up out of the sea and flung back the sunlight from her hundred palaces. Here we rest for the present, or rather, here we have been trying to rest, for some little time, but we run about too much to accomplish a great deal in that line. I would like to remain here. I had rather not go any further. There may be prettier women in Europe, but I doubt it. The population of Genoa is a hundred and twenty thousand. Two-thirds of these are women, I think, and at least two-thirds of the women are beautiful. They are as dressy and as tasteful and as graceful as they could possibly be, without being angels. However, angels are not very dressy, I believe. At least the angels in pictures are not. They wear nothing but wings. These Genoese women do look so charming. Most of the young damn demoiselles 
Damsels are robed in a cloud of white from head to foot, though many trick themselves out more elaborately. Nine-tenths of them wear nothing on their heads but a filmy sort of veil which falls down their backs like a white mist. They are very fair, and many of them have blue eyes, but black and dreamy dark brown ones are met with oftenest. The ladies and gentlemen of Genoa have a pleasant fashion of promenading in the large park on the top of a hill in the center of the city from six till nine in the evening, and then eating ices in a neighboring garden an hour or two longer. We went to the park on Sunday evening. Two thousand persons were present, chiefly young ladies and gentlemen. The gentlemen were dressed in the very latest Paris fashions, and the robes of the ladies glinted among the trees like so many snowflakes. The multitude moved round and round the park in a great procession, the bands played, and so did the fountains. The moon and the gas lamps lit up the scene, and altogether it was a brilliant and an animated picture. I scanned every female face that passed, and it seemed to me that all were handsome. I never saw such a freshet of loveliness before. I did not see how a man of only ordinary decision of character could marry here, because before he could get his mind made up, he would fall in love with somebody else. Never smoke any Italian tobacco. Never do it on any account. It makes me shudder to think what it must be made of. You cannot throw an old cigar stub down anywhere, but some vagabond will pounce upon it in the instant. I like to smoke a good deal, but it wounds my sensibilities to see one of these stub hunters watching me out of the corner of his hungry eyes and calculating how long my cigar will be likely to last. It reminded me too painfully of that San Francisco undertaker who used to go to sick beds with his watch in his hand and time the corpse. One of these stub hunters followed us all over the park last night and we never had a smoke that was worth anything. We were always moved to appease him with the stub before the cigar was half gone, because he looked so viciously anxious. He regarded us as his own legitimate prey, by right of discovery, I think, because he drove off several other professionals who wanted to take stock in us. Now, they surely must chew up those old stubs and dry and sell them for smoking tobacco. Therefore, give your custom to other than Italian brands of the article. The Superb and the City of Palaces are names which Genoa has held for centuries. She is full of palaces, certainly, and the palaces are sumptuous inside, but they are very rusty without and make no pretensions to architectural magnificence. Genoa the Superb would be a felicitous title if it, if it referred to the women. We have visited several of the palaces, immense, thick-walled piles with great stone staircases, tessellated marble pavements on the floors. Sometimes they make a mosaic work of intricate designs wrought in pebbles or little fragments of marble laid in cement, and grand salons hung with pictures by Rubens, Guido, Titian, Paul Veronese, and so on and portraits of heads of the family in plumed helmets, and gallant coats of mail, and patrician ladies in stunning costumes of centuries ago. But of course, the folks were all out in the country for the summer, and might not have known enough to ask us to dinner if they had been at home. And so all the grand empty salons with their resounding pavements, their grim pictures of dead ancestors, and tattered banners with the dust of bygone centuries upon them, seemed to brood sudden, solemnly of death and the grave, and our spirits ebbed away, and our cheerfulness passed from us. We never went up to the eleventh story. We always began to suspect ghosts. There was always an undertaken-looking servant along, too, who handed us a program, pointed to the picture that began the list of the salon he was in, and then stood stiff and stark and unsmiling in his petrified livery, 
till we were ready to move on to the next chamber. Whereupon he marched sadly ahead and took up another malignantly respectful position as before. I wasted so much time praying that the roof would fall in on these dispirited flunkies that I had but little left to bestow upon palaces and pictures. And besides, as in Paris, we had a guide. Perdition catch all the guides. This one said he was the most gifted linguist in Genoa, as far as English was concerned, and that only two persons in the city beside himself could talk the language at all. He showed us the birthplace of Christopher Columbus, and after we had reflected in silent awe before it for fifteen minutes, he said it was not the birthplace of Columbus, but of Columbus's grandmother. When we demanded an explanation of his conduct, he only shrugged his shoulders and answered in barbarous Italian, I shall speak further in this gu of this guide in a future chapter. All the information we got out of him we shall be able to carry along with us, I think. I have not been to church so often in a long time as I have in the last few weeks. The people in these old lands seem to make churches their specialty. Especially does this seem to be the case with the citizens of Genoa. I think there is a church every three or four hundred yards all over town. The streets are sprinkled from end to end with shovel-hatted, long-robed, well-fed priests and the church bells by the dozens are pealing all the day long, nearly. Every now and then one comes across a friar of orders gray with shaven head, long, coarse robe, rope girdle and beads, and with feet cased in sandals or entirely bare. These worthies suffer in the flesh and do penance all their lives, I suppose, but they look like consummate famine breeders. They are all fat and serene. The old cathedral, cathedral of St. Lorenzo is about as notable a building as we have found in Genoa. It is vast and has columnades of noble pillars and a great organ and the customary pomp of gilded moldings, pictures, frescoed ceilings, and so forth. I cannot describe it, of course. It would require a good many pages to do that. But it is a curious place. They said that half of it, from the front door halfway down to the altar, was a Jewish synagogue before the Savior was born, and that no alteration had been made in it since that time. We doubted the statement, but did it reluctantly. <clears throat> we would much rather have believed it. The place looked in too perfect repair to be so ancient. The main point of interest about the cathedral is the little chapel of St. John the Baptist. They only allow women to enter it on one day in the year, on account of the animosity they still cherish against the sex, because of the murder of the saint to gratify a caprice of Herodias. In this chapel is a marble chest, in which, they told us, were the ashes of St. John. And around it was wound a chain, which, they said, had confined him when he was in prison. We did not desire to disbelieve these statements, and yet we could not feel certain that they were correct, partly because we could have broken that chain, and so could St. John, and partly because we had seen St. John's ashes before in another church. We could not bring ourselves to think St. John had two sets of ashes. They also showed us a portrait of the Madonna, which was painted by St. Luke. He did not look half as old and smoky as some of the pictures by Rubens. We could not help admiring the Apostle's modesty and never once mentioning in his writings that he could paint. But isn't this relic matter a little overdone? We find a piece of the true cross in every old church we go into and some of the nails that held it together. I would like, I would not like to be positive, but I think we have seen as much of a keg, as much as a keg of these nails. Then there is the crown of thorns. They have part of one in Saint Chapelle in Paris, and part of one also in Notre Dame. And as for bones of Saint Denis, I feel certain we have seen enough of them to duplicate him if necessary. 
I only meant to write about the churches, but I keep wandering from the subject. I could say that the Church of the Annunciation is a wilderness of beautiful columns, of statues, gilded moldings, and pictures almost countless, but that would give no one an entirely perfect idea of the thing, and so where is the use? One family built the whole edifice and have got money left. There is where the mystery lies. We had an idea at first that only a mint could have survived the expense. These people here live in the heaviest, highest, broadest, darkest, solidest houses one can, one can imagine. Each one might laugh a siege to scorn. A hundred feet front and a hundred high is about the style. And you go up three flights of stairs before you begin to come upon signs of occupancy. Everything is stone, and stone of the heaviest. Floors, stair rays, mantles, benches, everything. The walls are four to five feet thick. The streets generally are four or five to eight feet wide and as crooked as a corkscrew. You can go along one of these gloomy cracks and look up and behold the sky like a mere ribbon of light far above your head where the tops of the tall houses on either side of the street bend almost together. You feel as if you were at the bottom of some tremendous abyss with all the world far above you. You wind in and out and here and there in the most mysterious way and have no more, no more idea of the points of the compass than if you were a blind man. You can never persuade yourself that these are actually streets and the frowning, dingy, monstrous housings, houses dwellings till you see one of these beautiful, prettily dressed women emerge from them. See her emerge, see her emerge from a dark, dreary looking den that looks dungeon all over, from the ground away, halfway up to heaven. And then you wonder that such a charming moth could have come from such a forbidding shell as that. The streets are wisely made narrow and the houses heavy and thick and stony in order that the people may be cool in this roasting climate. And they are cool and stay so. And while I think of it, the men wear hats and have very dark complexions. But the women wear no headgear but a flimsy veil like a gossamer's web and yet are exceedingly fair as a general thing. As a general thing. Singular, isn't it? The huge palaces of Genoa are each supposed to be occupied by one family, but they could accommodate a hundred, I should think. They are relics of the grandeur of Genoa's palmy days, the days when she was a great commercial and maritime power several centuries ago. These houses, solid marble palaces though they be, are in many cases of a dull pinkish color outside and from pavement to eaves are pictured with Genoese battle scenes, with monstrous Jupiters and Cupids, and with familiar illustrations from Grecian mythology. Where the paint has yielded to age and exposure and is peeling off in flakes and patches, the effect is not happy. A noseless Cupid or a Jupiter with an eye out or a Venus with a fly blister on her breast are not attractive features in a picture. Some, <clears throat> some of these painted walls reminded me somewhat of the tall van plastered with fanciful bills and posters that follows the bandwagon of a circus about a country village. I have not heard or read that the outsides of the houses of any other, your other European cities are frescoed in this way. I cannot conceive of such a thing as Genoa in ruins. Such massive arches such ponderous substructions as support these towering broad-winged edifices we have seldom seen before, and surely the great blocks of stone of which these edifices are built can never decay. Walls that are as thick as any ordinary American doorway is high cannot crumble. The republics of Genoa and Pisa were very powerful in the Middle Ages. Their ships filled the Mediterranean and they carried on an extensive commerce with Constantinople and Syria. 
their warehouses were the great distributing depots from whence the costly merchandise of the East was sent abroad over Europe. They were warlike little nations and defied, in those days, governments that overshadowed them now as mountains overshadow molehills. The Saracens captured and pillaged Genoa 900 years ago, but during the following century, Genoa and Pisa entered into an offensive and defensive alliance and besieged the Saracen colonies in Sardinia and the Balearic Isles with an obstinacy that maintained its pristine vigor and held to its purpose for forty long years. They were victorious at last and divided their conquests equably among their great patrician families. Descendants of some of those proud families still inhabit the palaces of Genoa and trace their own features, a resemblance to the grim knights whose portraits hang in their stately halls and to pictured beauties with pouting lips and merry eyes whose originals, whose originals have been dust and ashes for many a dead and forgotten century. The hotel we live in belonged to one of those great orders of Knights of the Cross in the times of the Crusades, and its mailed sentinels once kept watch and ward in its massive turrets, and woke the echoes of these halls and corridors with their iron heels. But Genoa's greatness has degenerated into an unostentatious commerce in velvets and silver filigree work. They say that each European town has its specialty. These filigree things are Genoa's specialty. Her smiths take silver ingots and work them up into all manner of graceful and beautiful forms. They make bunches of flowers from flakes and wires of silver that counterfeit the delicate creations the frost weaves upon a window pane, and we were shown a miniature silver temple whose fluted columns, whose Corinthian capitals and rich entablatures, whose spire, statues, bells, and ornate lavishness of sculpture were wrought in polished silver, and with such matchless art that every detail was a fascinating study, and the finished edifice a wonder of beauty. We are ready to move again, though we are not really tired yet of the narrow passages of this old marble cave. Cave is a good word when speaking of Genoa under the stars. When we have been prowling at midnight through the gloomy crevices they call streets, where no footfalls but ours were echoing, where only ourselves were abroad, and lights appeared only at long intervals and at a distance, and mysteriously disappeared again, and the houses at our elbows seemed to, seemed to stretch upward farther than ever toward the heavens. The memory of a cave I used to know at home was always in my mind. With its lofty passages, its silence and solitude, its shrouding gloom, its sepulchral echoes, its flitting lights, and more than all, its sudden revelations of branch and crevices and corridors where we least expected them. <clears throat> we are not tired of the endless processions of cheerful, chattering gossipers that throng these courts and streets all day long, either, nor of the coarse-robed monks, nor of the asty wines, which that old doctor, whom we call the Oracle, with customary felicity in the matter of getting everything wrong, misterms nasty. But we must go, nevertheless. Our last sight was the cemetery, a burial place intended to accommodate 60,000 bodies, and we shall continue to remember it after we shall have forgotten the palaces. It is a vast, marble-colonnaded corridor, extending around a great unoccupied square of ground. Its broad floor is marble, and on every slab is an inscription, for every slab can covers a corpse. On either side, as one walks down the middle of the passage, are monuments, tombs, and sculpted figures that are exquis exquisitely wrought and are full of grace and beauty. They are new and snowy, Every outline is perfect, every feature guiltless of mutilation, flaw, or blemish, 
and therefore to us these far-reaching ranks of bewitching forms are a hundredfold more lovely than the damaged and dingy statuary they have saved from the wreck of ancient art and set up in the galleries of Paris for the worship of the world. Well provided with cigars and other necessaries of life, we are now ready to take the cars for Milan. All day long we, tra we sped through a mountainous country whose peaks were bright with sunshine, whose hillsides were dotted with pretty villas sitting in the midst of gardens and shrubbery, and whose deep ravines were cool and shady and looked ever so inviting from where we and the birds were winging our flight through the sultry upper air. We had plenty of chilly tunnels wherein to check our perspiration, though. We timed one of them. We were twenty minutes passing through it, going at the rate of thirty to forty-five miles an hour. Beyond Alessandria, we passed the battlefield of Marengo. Toward dusk, we drew near Milan and caught glimpses of the city and the blue mountain peaks beyond. But we were not caring for these things. They did not interest us in the least. We were in a fever of impatience. We were dying to see the renowned cathedral. We watched in this direction and that, all around, everywhere. We needed no one to point it out. We did not wish anyone to point it out. We would recognize it even in the desert of the Great Sahara. At last, a forest of great, graceful needles, shimmering in the amber sunlight, rose slowly above the pygmy housetops, as one sometimes sees in the far horizon, a gilded and pinnacled mass of cloud lift itself above the waste of waves at sea. The cathedral. We knew it in a moment. Half of that night and all of the next day, this architectural autocrat was our sole object of interest. What a wonder it is, so grand, so solemn, so vast, and yet so delicate, so airy, so graceful. A very world of solid weight, and yet it seems in the soft moonlight only a fairy delusion of frostwork that might vanish with a breath. How sharply its pinnacled angles and its wilderness of spires were cut against the sky, and how richly their shadows fell upon its snowy roof. It was a vision, a miracle, an anthem sung in stone, a poem wrought in marble. Howsoever you look at the great cathedral, it is noble, it is beautiful. Wherever you stand in Milan or within several seven miles of Milan, it is visible when it is visible. No other object can chain, can chain your whole attention, leave your other eyes unfettered by your will, but a single instant, and they will surely turn to seek it. It is the first thing you look for when you rise in the morning, and the last your lingering gaze rests upon at night. Surely it must be the princeliest creation that ever brain of man conceived. At nine o'clock in the morning, we went and stood before this marble colossus. The central one of its five great doors is bordered with a bas relief of birds and fruits and beasts and insects, which have been so ingeniously carved out of the marble, marble that they seem like living creatures. And the figures are so numerous and the design so complex that one might study it a week without exhausting its interest. On that great steeple surmounting the myriad of spires, inside of the spires, over the doors, the windows, in nooks and corners, everywhere that a niche or a perch can be found about the enormous building from summit to base, there is a marble statue. And every statue is a study in itself. Raphael, Angelo, Canova, giants like these gave birth to the designs, and their own pupils carved them. Every face is eloquent with expression, and every attitude is full of grace. Away above, on the lofty roof, rank on rank of carved and fretted spires spring high, and high in the air, and through their rich tracery one sees the sky beyond. 
In their midst, the central steeple towers proudly up like the mainmast of some great Indiaman among a fleet of coasters. We wished to go aloft. The sacristan showed us a marble stairway. Of course it was marble, and of the purest, whitest, there is no other stone, no brick, no wood among its building materials, and told us to go up 182 steps and stop till he came. It was not necessary to say stop. We should have done that anyhow. We were tired by the time we got there. This was the roof. Here, springing from its broad marble flagstones, were the long files of spires, looking very tall close at hand, but diminishing in the distance like the pipes of an organ. We could see now that the statue on the top of each was the size of a large man, though they all looked like dolls from the street. We could see also that from the inside of each and every one of these hollow spires, from sixteen to thirty-one beautiful marble statues looked out upon the world below. From the eaves to the comb of the roof stretched in endless succession great curved marble beams, like the fore and aft braces of a steamboat, and along each beam, from end to end, stood up a row of richly carved flowers and fruits, each separate and distinct in kind, and over 15,000 species represented. At a little distance, these rows seemed to close together like the ties of a railroad track, and then the mingling together of the buds and blossoms of this marble garden forms a picture that is very charming to the eye. We descended and entered. Within the church, long rows of fluted columns, like huge monuments, divided the building into broad aisles, and on the figured pavement many, fell many a soft blush from the painted windows above. I knew the church was very large, but I could not fully appreciate its great size until I noticed that the men standing far down the altar looked like boys and seemed to glide rather than walk. We loitered about, gazing aloft at the monster windows, all aglow with brilliantly colored scenes in the lives of the Savior and his followers. Some of these pictures are mosaics, and so artistically are there a thousand particles of tinted glass or stone put together that the work has all the smoothness and finish of a painting. We counted sixty panes of glass in one window, and each pane was adorned with one of these master achievements of genius and patience. The guide showed us a coffee-colored piece of sculpture, which he said was considered to have come from the hand of Phidias, since it was not possible that any other artist of any epoch could have copied nature with such faultless accuracy. The figure was of a man without a skin, with every vein, artery, muscle, every fiber and tendon and tissue of the human frame represented in minute detail. It looked natural because somehow it looked as if it were in pain. A skinned man would be likely to look that way unless his attention were occupied with some other matter. It was a hideous thing, and yet there was a fascination about it somewhere. I am very sorry I saw it, because I will always see it now. I shall dream of it sometimes. I shall dream that it is resting its corded arms on the bed's head and looking down on me with its dead eyes. I shall dream that it is stretched between the sheets with me and touching me with its exposed muscles and its stringy cold legs. It is hard to forget repulsive things. I remember yet how I ran off from school once when I was a boy, and then, pretty late at night, concluded to climb into the window of my father's office and sleep on a lounge because I had a delicacy about going home and getting thrashed. As I lay on the lounge and my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, I fancied I could see a long, dusky, shapeless thing stretched upon the floor. A cold shiver went through me. I turned my face to the wall. That did not answer. I was afraid that that thing would creep over and seize me in the dark. 
I turned back and stared at it for minutes and minutes. They seemed hours. It appeared to me that the lagging moonlight never, never would get to it. I turned to the wall and counted twenty to pass the feverish time away. I looked. The pale square was nearer. I turned again and counted fifty. It was almost touching it. With desperate will, I turned again and counted one hundred and faced about all in a tremble. A white human hand lay in the moonlight, such an awful sinking at the heart, such a sudden gasp for breath. I felt, I cannot tell what I felt. When I recovered strength enough, I faced the wall again, but no boy could have remained with that, remained so with that mysterious hand behind him. I counted and looked again. The most of a naked arm was exposed. I put my hands over my eyes and counted till I could stand it no longer, and then the pallid face of a man was there, with the corners of the mouth drawn down, and the eyes fixed and glassy in death. I raised to a sitting posture and glowered on that corpse till the light crept down the bare breast line. By line, inch by inch, past the nipple, and then it disclosed its ghostly sta ghastly stab. I went away from there. I do not say I went away in any sort of a hurry, but I simply went. That is sufficient. I went out at the window, and I carried the sash along with me. I did not need the sash, but it was handier to take it than it was to leave it, and so I took it. I was not scared, but I was considerably agitated. When I reached home, they whipped me, but I enjoyed it. It seemed perfectly delightful. That man had been stabbed near the office that afternoon, and they carried him in there to doctor him, but he only lived an hour. I have slept in the same room with him often since then, in my dreams. Now we will descend into the crypt, under the grand altar of Milan Cathedral, and receive an impressive sermon from lips that have been silent and hands that have been gestureless for three hundred years. The priest stopped in a small dungeon and held up his candle. This was the last resting place of a good man, a warm-hearted, unselfish man, a man whose whole life was given to succoring the poor, encouraging the faint-hearted, visiting the sick, in relieving distress whenever and wherever he found it. His heart, his hand, and his purse were always open. With his story in one, one's mind, he can almost see his benignant countenance moving calmly among the haggard faces of Milan in the days when the plague swept the city. Brave where all others were cowards, full of compassion where pity had been crushed out of all other breasts by the instinct of self-preservation gone mad with terror. Cheering all, praying with all, helping all with hand and brain and purse. At a time when parents forsook their children, the friend deserted the friend, and the brother turned away from the sister while her pleadings were still wailing in his ears. This was good St. Charles Borromeo, Bishop of Milan. The people idolized him. Princes lavished uncounted treasures upon him. We stood in his tomb. Nearby was the sarcophagus, lighted by the dripping candles. The walls were faced with base reliefs, representing scenes in his life done in massive silver. The priest put on a short, white lace garment over his black, black robe, crossed himself, bowed reverently, and began to turn a windlass slowly. The sarcophagus separated in two parts lengthwise, and the lower part sank down and disclosed a coffin of rock crystal as clear as the atmosphere. Within lay the body robed in costly habiliments, covered with gold embroidery, and starred with scintillating gems. The decaying head was black with age. The dry skin was drawn tight to the bones. The eyes were gone. 
There was a hole in the temple, and another in the cheek, and the skinny lips were parted as in a ghastly smile. Over this dreadful face, its dust and decay, and its mocking grin, hung a crown sewn thick with flashing brilliance, and upon the breast lay crosses and croziers of solid gold that were splendid with emeralds and diamonds. How poor and cheap and trivial these gugas seemed in the presence of solemnity, the grandeur, the awful majesty of death. Think of Milton, Shakespeare, Washington, standing before a reverent world tricked out in the glass beads, the brass earrings, and tin trumpery of the savages of the plains. Dead Bartolomeo, Bartolomeo preached his pregnant sermon, and its burden was, You that worship the vanities of earth, you that long for worldly honor, worldly wealth, worldly fame, behold their worth. To us it seemed that so good a man, so kind a heart, so simple a nature, deserved rest and peace in a grave sacred from the intrusion of prying eyes, and believed that he himself would have preferred to have it so. But peradventure our wisdom was at fault in this regard. As we came out upon the floor of the church again, another priest volunteered to show us the treasures of the church. What more? The furniture of the narrow chamber of death we had just visited weighed six millions of francs in ounces and carats alone, without a penny thrown into, into the account for the costly workmanship bestowed upon them. But we followed into a large room filled with tall wooden presses like wardrobes. He threw them open, and behold, the cargoes of crude bullion of the assay offices of Nevada faded out of my memory. There were virgins and bishops there, above their natural side, above their natural size, made of solid silver, each worth by weight from eight hundred thousand to two millions of francs, and bearing gemmed books in their hands worth eighty thousand. There were bas reliefs that weighed six hundred pounds, carved in solid silver, croziers and crosses and candlesticks, six and eight feet high all of virgin gold, and brilliant with precious stones. And besides these were all manner of cups and vases and such things, rich in proportion. It was in Aladdin's palace. The treasures here, by simple weight, without counting workmanship, were valued at fifty millions of francs. If I could get the custody of them for a while, I fear me the marketplace of silver bishops would advance shortly on account of their exceeding scarcity in the cathedral of Milan. The priests showed us two of St. Paul's fingers and one of St. Peter's. A bone of Judas Iscariot, it was black, and also bones of all the other disciples. A handkerchief in which the Savior had left the impression of his face. Among the most precious of the relics were a stone from the Holy Sepulchre, part of the crown of thorns. They have a whole one at Notre Dame. A fragment, <clears throat> a fragment of the purple robe worn by the Savior, a nail from the cross, and a picture of the Virgin and Child painted by the veritable hand of St. Luke. This is the second of St. Luke's virgins we have seen. Once a year, all these holy relics are carried in procession through the streets of Milan. I like to revel in the driest details of the great cathedral. The building is 500 feet long by 180 wide, and the principal steeple is in the neighborhood of 400 feet high. It has 7,148 marble statues, and will have upwards of 3,000 more when it is finished. In addition, it has 1,500 bas reliefs. It has 136 spires, 21 more are to be added. Each spire is surmounted by a statue six and a half feet high. Everything about the church is marble and all from the same quarry. It was bequeathed to the Archbishop archbishopric for this purpose centuries ago. 
so nothing but the mere workmanship costs. Still, that is expensive. The bill foots up 684 millions of francs this far, thus far, considerably over a hundred millions of dollars, and it is estimated that it will take a hundred and twenty years yet to finish the cathedral. It looks complete, but it is far from being so. We saw a new statue put in its niche yesterday, alongside of which, alongside of one which had been standing these four hundred years, they said. There are four staircases leading up to the main steeple, each of which cost a hundred thousand dollars, with the four hundred and eight statues which adorn them. Marco Campioni was the architect who designed the wonderful structure more than five hundred years ago, and it took him forty-six years to work out the plan and get it ready to hand over to the builders. He is dead now. The building was begun a little less than five hundred years ago. <clears throat> and the third generation hence will not see it completed. The building looks best by moonlight, because the older portions of it, being stained with age, contrast unpleasantly with the newer and wider portions. It seems somewhat too broad for its height, but maybe familiarity with it might dissipate this impression. They say that the Cathedral of Milan is second only to St. Peter's of Rome, I cannot understand how it can be second to anything made by human hands. We bid it goodbye now, possibly for all time. How surely, in some future day, when the memory of it shall have lost its vividness, shall we half believe we have seen it in a wonderful dream, but never with waking eyes.